when I first joined Rob's lab, he still had what was an iconic look for him for 20 or 30 years that he's been in the field, which was a, the big mustache that you'll see in all the old pictures of him. And he shaved it off a couple of months after I joined the lab. And later that summer, I went to my first ever scientific conference. Instead of asking what I was going to work on or what it was like to be trained by him, that year the first question was always, is it true the mustache is gone? <laughs> Rob's career is very interesting. I think it's a fantastic example for the best type of physician scientist. He is really an inspiration, I believe, to people who would like to have a medically relevant career in biomedical research. Rob speaks his mind and makes it very clear when he thinks that an experiment isn't up to the rigor to snuff of the lab and he'll be your harshest critic behind closed doors. That's always true as his trainee. He makes sure that all of the work that comes out of the lab is really at the top level of the field. His trainees have gone on to hold national leadership positions in science and founded successful laboratories of their own at top universities all over the world. He started off as a psychiatrist, but he decided early on that he would love to know more about how the brain actually works. He would love to understand better what happens when the brain becomes dysfunctional in psychiatric diseases. So he became fascinated by the phenomenon of synaptic plasticity early in his career, and he worked for a long time in a close collaboration with another famous neuroscientist called Roger Nickel at UCSF. And there, Rob and Roger together discovered pathways that are essential for specific forms of synaptic plasticity. He comes to Stanford, summa cum laude at Harvard, you know, and he's turned down by the MD-PhD program. This is the first time in his life that he's failed at something. He decided, I'm doing it on my own. And sure enough, he did it. MD, PhD in five years. <laughs> so that, that's Rob. Uh, Rob has a goal, and he will arrive at that goal no matter what. I grew up in a suburb of Boston called Belmont, Massachusetts. You know, fairly traditional immigrant upbringings where education was highly valued. My parents had a really close social network. And all of my parents' friends, for the most part, were professors, academics. So being a professor at Harvard or MIT or Brandeis was absolutely no big deal to me. I used to play touch football with these guys on Saturday mornings, and I was much more impressed by their ability to throw a football than by the prizes they have won. I was basically a jock in junior high and high school. All I cared about was sports. I was captain of my high school soccer team. I was on the varsity basketball team. I was captain of the high school tennis team. There was this sort of unsaid message of work hard and try to excel in whatever you did. And we won't bother you as long as we are excelling. <laughs> so, I mean, it clearly had an effect on me. I went to my local college, I went to Harvard, really with no idea what I wanted to do. The second semester of my sophomore year, I took a class called Physiological Psychology, which was all about brain behavior relationships. And it's the first course I had taken at Harvard that I really liked, I was fascinated by you could actually think about what controls or regulates aggressive behavior. You know, what parts of the brain may be important for encoding new memories. And it had never dawned on me that this was a topic you could study. I started getting interested in what we now call neuroscience. I worked in a sleep research lab run by a guy named Alan Hobson. So I would go to Alan Hobson's lab and never say a word. I would just show up and do my work and leave. And I would never ask a question. I was just painfully shy and insecure about my ability to intellectually think about the topics we were studying. 
and some of some of the audience may know I've, I've, I've shifted quite a bit since then. Rob came into my lab with at least the appearance of incredible confidence. It was one of those pivotal moments in one's career where uh, you just connect. And we worked together. First, he was a postdoc and then a collaborator for 15 years. Uh, and we published over 70 papers together. Roger and I, with another postdoc named Julie Cower, really decided to attack this phenomenon of long-term potentiation, which we call LTP. And LTP is a synaptic model for the changes in synapses most neuroscientists believe are very important for the encoding of new information or learning in memory. You have to imagine that there's many different ways in which a synapse can be changed. There's many different types of plasticity. But the one that's been best studied is called LTP, long-term potentiation. And it's a particular form of LTP that Roger and Rob study together. Rob is really committed to high-quality science driven by carefully controlled experiments. What he helped to discover were the calcium-dependent mechanisms that drive that process. So calcium needs to flow into the postsynaptic terminal in order to trigger the molecular changes that strengthen that synapse. And those were some of the first mechanistic insights into how that process happens. His contribution to that project was, honestly speaking, brilliant. He really came up with ideas such as the involvement of specific phosphatases that have been guiding the field ever since. During my time at Stanford, I've been incredibly privileged to be the Pritzker professor and director of the Pritzker lab. When I arrived in 99 and over the course of the next decade, it was apparent that neuroscience research was growing on campus and it was spread out. Brian Wandel, who was then the chair of psychology, started getting together on a monthly basis to start talking about what would it take to establish a university-wide neurosciences institute that would break down the boundaries that still existed between different disciplines and different schools at Stanford. And then we were very fortunate to get a very generous gift from Clara Wu and Joe Tsai, a naming gift, so it became the Wu Tsai Neurosciences Institute. His role, as he sees it, and I think he's uh, extraordinary at it, is to bring the rigor of neuroscience to psychiatry. And he's highly respected among both hardcore scientists and also clinicians. My lab is now not only studying MDMA, but also studying what I would call classic psychedelics or hallucinogens like psilocybin, both because I think they can tell us something important about how the brain mediates its amazing functions, and also because these substances are receiving a lot of attention for their therapeutic potential. And I'm always thinking about how, to, how could my work in the Pritzker lab generate hypotheses that might have impact in individuals with various forms of psychiatric illness. His interest has really moved towards a uh, very human behavior, <laughs> because we are social animals. That's at the core of our existence. And his contributions in this field, I think, are part of a larger effort in the neuroscience community, a very, very large effort, in fact, to understand what synaptic connections in the brain might be important for specific behaviors, especially behaviors that are relevant to the human experience. Rob is an exceptional candidate to receive the Sterling Lifetime Award in Medicine because there are very few people in the field who have had such a fundamental impact on the way that we understand such a wide-ranging breadth of topics. His style of doing science, which is 
characterized by a deep commitment to the rigor of the work. Those are characteristics now that infuse the rest of the field through the folk study has trained. I think that his trainees were lucky to be in his lab because they could learn both how to communicate science and also how to actually focus on the data and stay within the bounds of the data in communicating science. Your legacy as a senior scientist is not only the actual science you did, but who trained in your lab, who went through your lab and was influenced by the way one does science, the way one thinks about science. And I'm very proud of the people who have come through my lab. As I look back on my career, I appreciate much more now than I did as a postdoc or grad student or assistant associate professor. What a privileged career I've had and how lucky I am that Stanford has welcomed me with open arms and provided this incredibly rich intellectual environment in which to conduct my research. And I wish I could say something really naughty, all right? But, uh, you know, that's the problem with Rob, all right? You just can't find, you know, something to, you know, rip at him on. No, he's, uh, he's real, you know, he's a real deal.